Um, so what, what we have seen yesterday is that, uh, uh, just to summarize, in, in the weight space of uh, <coughs> neural networks, when uh, non-convex neural networks storing random patterns, and again, with random labels, so I'm not, the, this property do not depend on, say, much on the data, but rather on uh, the, the, the device itself, uh, the weight space can be, you know, mm, composed of uh, narrow minima of the loss function of the errors. Well, I mean, these are the regions in the weight space such that the error over the training set is equal to zero, okay? And then you might have, you know, larger regions and so on. But <clears throat> what we have shown is that... Uh, uh, there, there's one thing important which is common to both discrete and continuous network is that <clears throat> whatever is the structure of the most numerous solutions, so that those that dominate when you sample them, there exist rare regions that are, uh, though they're rare, they're attractive for algorithms and they're extremely dense. So this is like saying that your landscape you know, can be uh, in the W space, the landscape can be, you know, something uh, like this and so on. But somewhere you have something like this, a wide flat minimum, okay? And, and this is attractive for algorithms that do not satisfy detail balance because if they would try to minimize just to maximize the Gibbs measure, so to minimize just the energy which is defined as the number of errors over the training set, with probability one, essentially, you get stuck in, uh, in metastable states, okay? So, but if you just forget about these constraints that come from physics, which allow for any sort of stochastic process that not necessarily wants to minimize that, it's kind of easy to be attracted here. Hmm? And we conjecture that this phenomenon plays an important role in deep learning. Hmm? Now, if you don't mind, since I know that there's some of you who are interested about stochasticity in these systems, I would like to, to give you a couple of examples of stochastic processes that converge in, this, in these states and do not satisfy detail balance. That are, uh, and then next I will move to the last and hopefully most interesting part of the talk. Um, <coughs> to the organizer, I apologize, but I have to leave before the end of my talk. So, uh, because I have a taxi, so that uh, happens. Um, no, I have a taxi at 20 past four, so, um, okay, um, that's fine. So, just to, so this was a picture in which what we did was to compute analytically <clears throat> uh, this is the so-called weight enumerator function. So you choose a certain configuration W, and then you count how many other configurations of the weights exist at a given distance from this reference configuration that satisfy the training set, okay? And uh, so you compute uh, the log of the volume corresponding to these other solutions that are at a distance d, uh, divided by the maximum volume uh, of the distance just to, uh, uh, for normalization purposes. And so from this plot, you can compute this analytically for, for uh, random systems. From this plot, you see that this is what you see from one typical solution. And you see that if you are sitting in a typical solution and you move away, quickly solution disappears. So if you are in a typical solution, so in one of these most probable minima, then you don't see much around you. This green curve is, is given by a, a particular algorithm, which is called least action algorithm. And this algorithm ends up in minima that are slightly wider than the typical ones. And as you see that uh, if you take as a reference configuration a solution given by this algorithm, a solution to the learning problem, and you ask yourself, how many other solutions do I see at a given distance? It's, no, it goes down 
relatively quickly, but you see the convexity of the curve in, in zero. I mean, uh, around zero, you, the, it decreases uh, sharply. Whereas now, if you use another type of algorithm, which uh, in this case, analytically, we, we can do this, targets this kind of regions, then you find a solution that is flat up to a certain distance, which means you really end up in a region which is super flat, OK? So I think, I think this is nice. And uh, uh, let me show you. This is, a, I think, a, a, an amazing simulation that a student did. You take uh, a network with three then units, storing random patterns, blah, blah, blah. And then you compute a solution uh, with different algorithms, and then you check the Hessian. Okay, to as a measure of flatness. This is used every day. I mean, a lot of people do this in analyzing deep networks, right? And um, so watch out that this, this is a student, so the scale is are random. And uh, uh, so that you have to uh, think about it because, but anyhow, um, so let's take, okay, let's take stochastic gradient with mean square error, okay? So you end up in a minimum. And if you look at the spectrum here, you have you know, a lot of eigenvalues which are 0. And then you have this tail, which goes between, say, 0 and 300. OK, this is the scale, right? Now, if you use just gradient descent, you get, you get stuck in a minimum which is much wider. Uh, uh, sorry, much narrower in the sense that you have mo many of the eigenvalues of the Asian are actually positive, and, then, and the scale is between 0 and 2,000, OK? And if you use stochastic gradient with, well, let's forget about, let's just look at these two, just to make it think simpler. And then you, you use the, this algorithm that ends up in this wide minima. And if you look at the, at the eigenvalues, it's a delta and zero. And notice the scale, it's just between zero and 10. So you just, uh, uh, I, I've never seen such a nation. I don't know if you've ever seen such a nation in deep learning. I mean, it's really, Super flat. Okay, so just to say that this uh, this technique of using uh, as a as a cost function uh, the local entropy, uh, in which you don't compute the Hessian at all because you're considering local entropy over macroscopic lengths. Okay, so it's not a local quantity. As a byproduct, gives you this spectacular flatness even at a, a, lo a local level. Okay, so. Again, let me just mention that I don't, today I don't have time for this. So we have checked that, in fact, uh, the, uh, the wideness of the minima correlates with the generalization error on several uh, test sets, okay? either teacher-student scenarios or benchmarks. So everything looks pretty consistent in this uh, uh, set of shallow networks. Right? For deeper networks, we need to do more experiments. And we have some evidence, but I don't have things to report right now. OK, so just to conclude, so this concludes the, more or less the discussion we had yesterday. Okay? The, and one thing that I want to remind you is that it is a particular property of system that uh, are a threshold sum. Uh, if you take a, as a learning machine a so-called parity machine, in which instead of uh, taking, let's say, the sum and checking the threshold, take the product of the hidden states as an output, then uh, this machine does not display any, any flatness, OK? And, and it's very well known that you, could, you do nothing with this, with this device, OK? But it's just a technical example to say you need a machine that has the propensity to have this wide flat minima. And this machine does not have this propensity. So I wouldn't use it for, for learning. OK, let's see. OK, so, so before I, I, I discuss, before discussing the evolution of the, uh, that uh, took place in deep learning, let me show you a couple of examples of, of processes that, that uh, uh, end up in this wide flat minima. And the first one is, uh, is really super simple, and it is this one. So suppose that your weights are stochastic in the sense that what you can specify in your neural network is not. So you have your input. So 
you have your weight here, let's say this object, this is your weight, but you cannot specify its value, you can only specify its probability distribution. You can just, so let's say that W is a binary variable, and, and then, so you will have, you know, something like, uh, Okay. So the only thing you can specify is this eta. So you have a stochastic system. So the idea is the following. You present a pattern to this network. Okay. And again, the weights are, are uh, again, we are back to the simplest possible non-convex model, just for analytic purposes. Okay. But this will hold also for other systems. So you present a pattern, you extract at random your weights, and then you compute the output. This is the process. Okay, so it's a st you have stochastic weights, and now what learning, what does learning mean here in this context? It means that you somehow modify the probability distribution of the weights. Now, this is a, a, a truly stochastic device in which you present a pattern, extract your weights at random, compute the output, and check it. And then you use, uh, and then what you want to do in order to train this system is clearly to, um, to maximize the likelihood hmm? uh, of the output. Of I think I got confused. So here, when, when you feed an input to the network, right, the weights are either one or minus one, or actually they, they have a probability. So are you applying a probability? No, no, no. You compute. Uh, the weights have a certain probability to be plus or minus one, but when you actually compute it, you have to look at the you value. Extract the given value right? Yes. Yes. No, you do learn, but you learn this eta. Okay. You learn the probability distribution. So this model will reduce to the standard model if this probability distribution is fully picked on one value. But if you have a, a broad distribution, then uh, it's still stochastic. Okay. Is that? So when you compute, you when you compute the average, you sample from this distribution. Yes. The process. The process is when you use the network, you feed something, and then your synapses will tell you some value, and you compute the output. And somebody buys something, right? Right. I mean, on the computer, you sample. But if you have to imagine this as a model, simply the, your synapses is, is a stochastic device that most often gives, say, it takes a value plus one, or sometimes takes a value minus one. So it's, it's like saying that you cannot perfectly learn the, va uh, the value of the synapse. It's just it remains stochastic somehow, which is probably quite realistic. No? I mean. Probably it never takes twice the same value, right, uh, precisely. So, and so if you do this, then this, uh, this is a stochastic device. And uh, what you can do is uh, try to, um, well, in principle, what you would like to do is to find a W that maximizes the, uh, the probability that you get the right answer in the output. And so you can write this in a Bayesian context. And... Uh, so what uh, we can do here is just essentially write, uh, make a certain assumption about the probability distribution of, of, of the weights, and then try to maximize uh, the likelihood uh, under this, this assumption. So your, the cost function will be essentially the probability, the log likelihood related to the probability that the weights give the right uh, answer. So it's just a, a standard. Uh, um, the standard thing. Now, okay, and uh, as I wrote here, just in a different language, uh, we, we are going to parameterize the weights with uh, one real number, which characterizes the probability distribution. And what is good about this is that now you have a, a discrete system on which you can actually use any gradient descent algorithm because what you're actually learning are the probability distributions. But now the, the key point is that when you do this, um, <clears throat> you can, uh, this analytically, uh, you can you know, check, you can keep uh, under control the magnetization of the, the weights, I mean the bias of the weights. Okay, so um, let me call mi is equal 
to uh, <coughs> um, say the expected value of wi, OK? And now if this always take, if this uh, synapse, this weight is always, say, equal plus 1 you know, for all uh, the patterns, this would be a delta in 1. Otherwise, it's a, it can be between minus 1 and plus 1. Okay? So <clears throat> the idea is the following, is that one can show analytically, let me just describe uh, uh, analytically, that you can find solutions. You can find uh, solutions that satisfy all the training set when the magnetization of, of, the, of the weights is still different from 1. So in the stochastic regime, you can actually store everything. And you, know, you see that for a magnetization which is 0.85, which means that you still have a lot of fluctuation in the system, you can store everything. Okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and now, uh, and then if you run a stochastic gradient on, on, on any uh, simple stochastic process, uh, gradient descent on this, on this device, you will easily find solutions. Let me remind you that the original problem, the, the, the binary perception is totally hard to, to train. Okay? But in this case, it becomes totally easy. Why is so? Because if you keep the, the magnetization different from one, so if you are looking for solution in the regime in which the weights can fluctuate, they can only fluctuate in large, in wide flat minima. Okay? They cannot fluctuate if the minima are narrow. Okay? And so it's just a consistency argument. And, and therefore, if you allow the synapses to fluctuate and you try to train, they naturally uh, end up in this wide flat minima. Okay? This can be shown analytically, and I don't want to bother you too much with all this. But this is just to say that noise on the weights helps in this case. But not, it doesn't help because uh, you know, it's, it's not the kind of noise that helps to overcome a barrier. It's nothing to do with that. It's a kind of noise that allows you to identify this wide flat minima. It's, a, it's not the kind of noise you would think you know, in, in terms of simulated annealing or optimization. Yeah. Yes, this is a drop link. This is very similar to drop link. Yeah. Uh, again, I mean, you see, there are all these connections that uh, the, the, uh, drop, uh, there are two drops. One is drop out and drop link. In one case, you drop out the nodes. In the other case, you drop, drop out the links. So in this case, it's, it's a model for drop link. You could, we could also design a model for the. Uh, so again, this is a connection that we're going to explore, but it seems very strong. Okay? The key point is the following, that if you have an underlying optimization problem that has wide flat minimized solutions, then this solution will, will be the only one consistent with the fact of having a, a magnetic, a, a fluctuating variables, the only one. If you have, on the other hand, if you have a problem that has, only has a narrow minima, this would not help at all. So if you want to use this kind of device to train a parity machine, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So you need an underlying structure that has this property. Even if these wide minima are rare, it doesn't matter. With this kind of, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of system, you're going to end up there. But Clearly, in this case, we are maximizing the likelihood. We are not minimizing the energy. Eh? We are doing something which is totally different. Now, this is a, OK. So then let me, for the physicist here, let me just remind you that, OK, there is a quantum version of this. This is a bit ridiculous, but uh, OK. Um, uh, so we can imagine. To, OK, in order to use the language of, of physics, let me denote the Ws with some sigmas, OK? That's sigma, sigma z. So this is the z component of the Pauli matrix. But um, what we can do is, again, we can define, uh, well, this one. 
uh, we can define an energy function, which is this one, which is just the number of errors. Again, for the binary perceptron, uh, the same holds for, for other networks. Uh, just the number of errors. Right? And we know that if we try to perform simulated annealing on this, it's not going to work. So what about quantum annealing, in which, sorry, this is just for the physicists of those of you who are interested in quantum computing. And um, well, you can try a different approach and say, okay, I take this energy function as my objective, and then I, uh, so I identify the weights with the Z component of a Pauli matrix, and then I add a transverse uh, field in, in the x direction, so it's a quantum term. And, uh, and the idea is that, uh, of quantum annealing, sorry, is that you start with a very large gamma here, and so your system will be totally polarized in the x direction, and then you reduce this gamma, this magnetic field, say, you reduce it, and at the end of this process, when this is going to be zero, you are going to end up in the ground state of the original Hamiltonian. So you would have solved your problem, right? And uh, there is a theorem, the adiabatic theorem, that tells you that if you reduce this gamma slowly enough, uh, essentially the rate is inversely proportional to the gap between the ground state and the first excited state in, in, uh, in this Hamiltonian. If you do it slow enough, you are guaranteed to end up in the ground state. And in fact, the reason why quantum annealing doesn't work is that the gap is typically exponentially small, and so it doesn't work. But in this case, uh, in this case it does, even though simulated annealing fails. Hmm? So this is one example of this. So, and how do you show it? Well, let me uh, be quick. So when you study this, you typically do a quantum Monte Carlo simulation. So what you do is you perform a transformation, you map this, uh, you add one extra dimension, the so-called time dimension, and you can rewrite uh, a new Hamiltonian uh, in which you have uh, <coughs> many uh, uh, replicas of the original system which are coupled one with the, with the other by, uh, with the ferromagnetic coupling, okay? So you see, if you sample from this Hamiltonian with some Markov process, you get the, oops, sorry, you get uh, the probability distribution you would obtain by sampling from this using uh, density matrix and so, and so on, okay? But, so, uh, and you see that what you get is essentially a certain number of replicas of your initial system, but this is called a Suzuki trot. If you're not familiar, look it up, it's very nice. It's something, you know, a physicist should see once in, in its life. And then, uh, the, you have a coupling between different systems, and this coupling is ferromagnetic. So this gamma here is, you know, this quantity here. And the point is that when gamma goes to zero, the quantum effect goes to zero, this coupling becomes infinite, and so all the replicas have to collapse, and you end up with just one system, which is the classical one. That's the mechanism. Okay, but to make all this long story short, you see there are very big analogies between uh, a quantum the Suzuki Trotter representation of the problem, which is many systems coupled through this uh, nearest neighbors interaction, say, and the robust ensemble I described you, to you yesterday. So these replicated systems that are coupled to a centroid. They are very similar. And in fact, we exploited this similarity. We said, okay, but these are almost the same thing, so let's check what quantum annealing is doing. And, uh, and um, Okay, you can do all the calculation for this problem. I just skip it because, uh, and I go to the results. What you get is that as a function of gamma, you can solve analytically this problem. So as a function of gamma, you, uh, you can compute which is the uh, expected value of the classical energy in this quantum Hamiltonian. And it is, dot, it is this dot curve. Now, uh, if you then uh, try to do some quantum annealing, some simulations on the system, you see that uh, as you increase the number of slices and the quantum limit is obtained with infinite slices, you approach the theoretical curve. And in particular, you find that when uh, um, you make the transfer field go to zero, you, you recover zero energy. On the other hand, if you run simulated annealing, you get stuck at a finite energy, and as you increase the size of your problem, you get stuck to higher and higher energies. So at the end, you 
will be there for n equal to infinity. So you see, this is a weak quantum supremacy. It's just one example in which simulated annealing doesn't work and quantum annealing does work, which has nothing to do with quantum supremacy in absolute sense because as I told you yesterday, there are algorithms, classical algorithms that work in this case. But it is a nice example in which quantum fluctuations, just like the fluctuation in the synapse, would automatically lead you to identify uh, valleys which are very wide and end up in this rare minima. So from the quantum point of view, just for the physicists, why is it so? It, it is so because in the quantum Hamiltonian, even at zero temperature, you have kinetic energy, okay? And uh, the kinetic energy is somehow uh, proportional to how much a system can delocalize. So whereas in a classical system at zero energy, you either have entropy or you're stuck, at quantum level, you can still delocalize. So somehow the information about the entropy is encoded in the kinetic term of the Hamiltonian. And this is why the system, so this is just for the physicists, I apologize, but <clears throat> can, uh, can go in these states. And the idea is that as you reduce gamma, you end up in these states, and then as, when gamma is, uh, is zero, then you remain there, right? So somehow the quantum limit and the gamma going to zero limit does not do not commute, okay? So you see, the quantum fluctuation are dominated by these rare events in the limit gamma go to zero. So I don't know, for, maybe it's interesting for physics, I don't know. Okay, and uh, one can show that, uh, in fact, the minima that quantum annealing, fi the quantum annealing finds, if you just find one minimum and sample at random and check you know, the energy of the states around you, you find that the minimum is flat. Whereas if you uh, look at what happens around a, a, a local minimum found by simulated annealing, the, the gray curve is very narrow. Uh, these are uh, analytic curves, and uh, the fact that they start in the same point is just because I've subtracted the reference energy, but this gets stuck somewhere at higher energy, okay? It's just to have it on the same scale. Um, then there was a referee who asked us to do the real quantum dynamics, so that luckily enough, with the software nowadays, you can do things really quickly, and in particular with Carlo Baldassi, um, <clears throat> who is a great scientist and computer scientist. So we did the, the, the um, we analyzed the dynamics of this system and uh, um, essentially, okay, what we found that everything is consistent with the analytic calculations. So, and uh, in part, one thing that we could check is the following, is that if you take your original problem, which is the, dia in which the energy levels are on the diagonal of the Hamiltonian, and you randomly permute the, these elements, you are going to scramble and to um, uh, <clears throat> get rid of all the geometry, right? Because previously a certain energy level corresponded to certain states. Now you reshuffle, you keep the energy level, but you place them you know, in states which are uh, random. So you don't have any more this structure in which uh, you have these dense regions, okay? And if you now run simulated, you run quantum manipulating on, on, on this system, you observe the exponential slowdown. You find that it doesn't work anymore. So quantum annealing, sorry, would, you know, in this reshuffle spectrum get stuck here. It's not able to go down to zero. So really it's related to the geometrical structure of this wide minimum in which the system can delocalize, okay? And if you compute the spectrum, you find that for the reshuffled system at a certain value of gamma, which is different from zero, you find small gaps. Whereas in the original system, you find no small gaps. Okay, so, uh, so this is an example, of the, I've given you two examples of fluctuations which are uh, attracted by these uh, this, uh, dense states, and then there are a lot of other simple stochastic process, but at least in these two cases we can do the calculations, okay? Now let's go back to machine learning. Okay, this is, was, this is the last thing I want to tell you. This is the first step in the plan of understanding all the tricks that have been introduced in deep learning. Um, and uh, so the, the, um, the thing I want to discuss is why people started to use the cross entropy. Okay, why is it so? In, in systems which are not stochastic, 
in the deterministic network. Mm -hmm. OK, so first of all, uh, you take what is the cross entropy? Essentially, it's related to the fact that you interpret the output of a neuron as the probability of uh, the label, not at, at, as the label itself. Okay, so you normalize the output so that it's between 0 and 1, and then the output y is just the probability that the label corresponding to the, to the input is, say, 1 and, and not 0, given the input and, and the weights. Okay? You just interpret that. And the idea is that you have your neural network, and then when you are at the end of your neural network, instead of reading the output, you read this value, flip a coin, and decide. So you are introducing artificially this coin flipping. OK? It's an abuse, in a sense. And uh, so um, then clearly, if you interpret, I, I mean, so if now you interpret the output as a probability, then, uh, uh, or in this case, we assume that the labels are 0, 1. Then you can write, let's say, the probability that the output is y, uh, uh, corresponds to label equal 1 is y. The probability that um, the label is 0 is, say, 1 minus y in the case of just two, two classes. And so the probability of a given label, given the weights and the input, can be written in this form. You can check it. If t is equal to 0, you get this disappears, you get 1 minus y. And if t is equal to 1, this disappears, you get y, which can be written as in this entropic form. Okay? And this is essentially the, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, so now if you sum over all the patterns, you get this uh, likelihood that you want to maximize. And so you can redefine your learning problem as the problem of minimizing a loss function, which is given by this entropic term, this likelihood term, plus, say, a regularization if you want. OK, so this is, now there are various ways Then you can consider softmax, which is more or less the same thing. But uh, so, so the cross entropy is more or less this, this quantity, OK? In, this is in a specific case in, what, in which one can do the calculation. Um, <clears throat> OK, so, so in this setting in which you flip uh, artificially a coin, uh, the, you, by maximizing this likelihood, you would find the w uh, uh, that is, the, say, the most probable vector given the data. OK, so now what happens in, uh, now for, for when you use this in, uh, in uh, neural networks? Well. <clears throat> Whenever you present a pattern, if you compute, uh, so here, OK, I, I, get, I have this, this type of network. Again, the input is psi. The weights are w. OK, so I apologize. I do the calculation again for the binary perceptor, but they, they can be generalized. It's just the length of the calculation is proportional to the number of hidden nodes. So, uh, but this is a non-convex case, so it's, it's enough. So you have uh, a device. You have an input. Xi I, xi mu, and then uh, <clears throat> this is the, x mu is the is the local field. So here you have xi mu, here you have x mu, which is equal to say, okay, one over square root of n x. OK, for, for this device. And then uh, <clears throat> this is uh, the formula for the, uh, that comes from the cross entropy. So for, uh, when you present a pattern, for each pattern, you pay a cost, which is given by this expression, that more or less tells you the following. If the x is aligned with the desired output, it is blue line here, OK? If x is not aligned with the desired output as the opposite sign, you pay a price, OK? So you want to minimize this. If it is correct, so if it is you know, consistent, you still pay a price until the, this input to the output is sufficiently large, where sufficiently depends on this gamma, which is a kind of temperature for, that you put in front of the 
of the probability. But anyhow, let's take a fixed gamma for the moment. So the idea is the following. It's like a bit of hinge loss in a sense. So uh, in, in the cross entropy case, uh, you still pay a price. You still reject patterns, uh, weights that correctly store the patterns but are not sufficiently robust. Okay? That's the, if you think to the cross entropy as a deterministic function, you have, you know, we have introduced this cross entropy by flipping a coin, but let's forget that at the end of the day, when you compute things, it's like using an error function that has this sh blue shape here. Whereas if you just use the error loss function for one given pattern, if the x has the wrong sign, you pay a price equal to one, and if there's a correct sign, you pay zero and you want to sum up this over all patterns. Or, uh, I mean, you can have other type of losses, but this is the main mechanism, okay? So when you have the error loss, you pay a price when it, there's a mistake. When you have the cross entropy loss, you pay a price also if there are no mistakes, but you're close to the threshold, say. Is this clear? I mean, as a, how to derive this is, is just the two lines of calculation, it's not so important. I mean. The way you practically use cross entropy is this one, okay? Good, so what we did is to do the following calculation. First of all, I, I, we take our non-convex device, your, again, the binary perceptron, and we can do it also for continuous uh, devices, um, and compute which are the properties of the ground state of the cross entropy, okay? This is the first thing. And I spare you the pain, but uh, what you find is the following result. That, let, let me remind you that uh, 8.83 is the critical capacity, say, for this device storing random patterns. So what we find is that there's a wide range of uh, alpha, so you can store a lot of patterns, and the ground state of the cross entropy corresponds to configuration of zero errors which makes a lot of sense because, I, as we have seen, uh, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the cross-entropy uh, you know, uh, favors correct configurations, okay? So this is, uh, this is fine. So, but the real question is, okay, now we have this different loss function, which is capable of finding solutions. Um, because just to, just to clarify one thing is that you see the, the, the total loss with the cross entropy has this form here. And this F is not a function which is either 0 or 1. It, it, you know, it's, it, it, it always changes as you change W. It's not bounded like the error loss that is bounded by 0 and, and that's it. This can continuously change even if you are not making any error. Okay? Because... Um, so the ground state, it's not obvious just by looking at the ground state that you're not making a mistake. You have to check it. So you have to do a, a slightly more complicated calculation because you could have, you know, kind of uh, uh, terms that compensate here. And uh, so it's not clear. But anyhow, um, the calculation tells you that in the ground state, you compute the number of errors, you find that it works. Now, the question is, okay, you find the solution, let's say. So what is the nature of this solution? Is this, uh, you remember that for this device, uh, what you have is that um, um, you have an exponential number of solutions plus these dense regions somewhere, okay? Now, the question is, what does this uh, function find? Hmm? And, um, and this is all analytical, okay? I mean, these are analytical calculations. I don't yet have any algorithm doing anything. I'm just computing the property of the ground state of this function here. Okay, now, first of all, what you can do is actually implement a kind of a simulated annealing algorithm using the cross entropy as an energy function instead of the energy function, instead of the errors. And if you do that, you can check that it works. It does find solutions. That's already an empirical evidence that things are, are going in the right direction. But then, to be precise, what you have to do is to say, okay, now I that I found a ground state of the cross entropy, 
And suppose that I sit on this ground state. What, what do I see around me? Okay. Do, 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 what do I see? Do I see other solution? I'm, I'm in an empty region. Where am I? That's the, the kind of uh, problem. Uh, <clears throat> okay. And uh, um, um, I think I've been super fast, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I was a bit worried. And okay. So this is, a, and in order to do this, um, you have to uh, to do the following. Okay, suppose that you have a probability distribution which is characterizes the ground state of the of the cross entropy. Okay, the Gibbs measure we, in which you use as an energy the cross entropy, and you sample from this distribution, and then on on the other hand you have another probability distribution which is the probability distribution of, say, the error loss of the standard error energy function. And what you would like to, do, to, to know in this case is given a typical configuration of the cross entropy, so by sampling from the cross entropy, okay, so I'm not optimizing. So I'm not looking for Ws that optimize the density. No. In this case, I'm just sampling from the ground state of the cross entropy. OK? Then I ask myself, how many configurations that are ground state of the error function do I see? OK? So it is, it's called, this is called the Franz Parisi method. So suppose now I sample from the cross entropy. I find the ground state of the cross entropy, and then I ask myself uh, <clears throat> uh, what is the um, how many configurations that are ground state of the error loss do I see okay so essentially it's it's like it's like a bit like the the kind of calculation we did before in which we uh, <clears throat> uh, we fix the configuration and count how many solution we see around but here is done uh, analytically, by not by fixing uh, a configuration, but just analytically by saying, I find a typical configuration extracted from the, the ground state of the cross entropy. Okay? So I assume I have a fair sampling of, of this ground state, and then I compute uh, everything. Now, this is a very, <clears throat> in order to compute this entropy, you need to be able to compute this partition function, and this is a quite complicated. Uh, Object. So you see that this term here is the sampling from the from the cross entropy. This f is the energy function of, of the cross entropy, and here you have the log of this trace over the configuration that minimizes the energy of the error function. And this beta, you could choose different betas, but I say you have we want beta to be to go to infinity, so we are concentrating on zero temperatures so on. on on ground states. Okay, and here you have a control parameter which controls the distance between ground states of the uh, cross entropy which, uh, and ground states of the error loss, which is this B. Okay, so this, uh, this set of variables. So you have to be able, and this is a normalized, so you have to be able to compute this, this quantity. <coughs> So essentially, you want to, com to compute the average of this log with this probability distribution. You see that this is normalization. This is the, so this is a kind of the, uh, the way, the, 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 the probability, and you want to average this quantity here. OK? Now, doing this is, uh, is quite complicated. And um, um, Why it's complicated? First of all, because this quantity itself is exponential, and therefore it's, it does not concentrate. So in order to find, uh, <clears throat> so that zeta fp, FP stands for Franz Parisi. Huh? OK, this is something that fluctuates exponentially. So the, in order to find the typical one, the most probable one, you, you, you have to compute this as 
e to the expectation value of the log of this ZFP. Okay? So again, what you have to do is actually to compute the expectation of the log. Because this is going to concentrate, and that's what you're going to observe. So you first have this log here. But then, since you want to compute the expectation of an entropy, you have another log there. So this log contains, so this is a log, but inside here, you also have another log. OK? And so <clears throat> what you're going to do is to use the replica trick for this log here and another replica trick for this log here. OK, so it's quite heavy. So you see you have an index A here that goes from 1 to n. And this allows you to, to write that log as uh, the nth power of the argument. And then <clears throat> you have another set of, uh, of replicas. Don't be confused by the real replicas that you use in algorithm and the virtual replicas of this calculation. OK, two different things. And then you have this index R which corresponds to the replication of the internal log. OK? So that's the, the, so when you do these calculations, sorry, let me, I've skipped just one second. <clears throat> I don't know where I put. <coughs> OK, it doesn't matter. I, I, will, I will skip this, so it's not. OK, so um, <clears throat> you can do this calculation. You have a double analytic continuation to, to be performed, and so on and so forth. So it's uh, kind of uh, complicated. But you can do it. It's you know, a lot of years of, of studies in, the, in this field of uh, are helpful in the sense that we know how to do this kind of calculations. And this is the result that you find. So if gamma is, uh, say, uh, let's say that we choose uh, alpha equals 0 0.4, which is more or less in the regime in which, in the regime in which solution exists, and they are, you know, the typical ones are far apart. And then you ask yourself, uh, this, these curves here are, are these this entropy, this Franz Parisi entropy, at a given overlap p. So when this p is, zero, is 1, it means distance 0, p large, it means um, p going to 0 means small distance, so, uh, big distances. So what you observe is that indeed for alpha equals, say, 0.4, close to the ground state of the cross entropy, you see an exponential number of solution of the pure classifier. That's the point. OK? So this is the, the result. That when you minimize the cross entropy, you end up in a region in which it, the problem is, let's say, easier to optimize. And around the typical point, you find an exponential number of, of solution for the original pure classifier. Not for the cross entropy, which you know it's kind of uh, <clears throat> might change, and so, but um, this includes solution that would not be considered as good configuration by the cross entropy because uh, cross entropy penalizes a lot of configuration that barely satisfy the pattern. You remember close to the to the threshold. So this is the the main uh, the main result, which you know it's really it's really really a, a long calculations. Uh, calculation. And, uh, and there are many things that can be observed here. Um, so first of all, uh, the, this, this gray line here is the maximum possible density. So it's the, it's the log of the binomial curve. Okay, It's the maximum number of configuration you can see, the log of the maximum number of configuration you can see a total number of configuration at a given overlap p or at a given distance. Okay, so this curve cannot go above this point. Okay, and what you see if you look carefully is, is the following: is that if this is the is the curve, the curve given by the the, the 
cross entropy behave like this. Okay? Now, if you choose, if your alpha is too big, uh, the cross entropy doesn't work anymore if you are too close to the critical capacity. And uh, what you find is um, that uh, <coughs> the curve goes like this. What, what does this mean is, is the following, is that up to a, a large value of alpha, the cross entropy finds solution which are surrounded by a very large number of solution of the pure class. Yes? Oops, sorry, I made, I made a mistake. This one. Yeah, like to just to assume a priori knowledge of the dimensional sampling of entropy, so entropy. Okay, what I'm doing here is, is the following. Um, if you look at the structure of this object, uh, you have two terms. Okay, so you have something like this. You have an integral over product d uh, omega. Uh, sorry, there's a measure. I mean, this could be this is could be a constraint on, on the on the weights. Okay, and then you have e to the minus beta f of uh, x dot w. Okay, sorry, this is a w, it's not an omega. Okay. And then here you have times the log of something, okay, divided by uh, this integral. And uh, yeah, there is a product here over mu, and here divided by product the mu omega w i, and then you have a product over mu e to the minus beta f. So what is this object? This object, if you think about it, this thing here is nothing but the Boltzmann weight of this F corresponding to this energy function. So what we are computing is the expectation value of this log of something with respect to the probability measure given by the cross entropy cost function. So in practice, what does this means is that if you look at a typical solution, a most probable solution given by uh, a loss function, uh, the, the cross entropy loss function, what is the expectation value of this object? Now, what do you want to, there are many things that you can put inside here. What we, we have chosen to, to look at here is just the number of solution of the pure classifier, which of course depend on the omega uh, the W that you extract from this probability distribution because you have this constraint on the overlap. Okay? So that's, that's the idea. So we are computing this very complicated expectation value. And this is why I say sampling because the, what I'm talking about here is a fair sampling from this probability distribution. Then you know, look what, what's going on around. Uh, and in order to do this, you have this double... This is, okay, this expectation per se, it's, it's uh, uh, an exponential quantity, so you have to take the log and so on and so forth. So you have two logs that you have to deal with, and you do the double analytic con uh, calculation, uh, um, continuation in order to find the result. Now, so what we find is, as I was saying, the following picture, that... So this is p equal 1, and this is p, say, equal 0. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and here you have the, the entropy. And so this is the, the upper bound for, for the entropy, for the number of, of solution that you observe at a given overlap p. And you know, in the regime in which it works, you find curves like this. And if you know, the parameters are 
uh, say alpha is too large, so you have too many patterns. You find other type of solutions. Um, for instance, you find this curve. So let's try to understand what these curves are telling us. At least two or three things are, are nice. First thing, if you are, if alpha is too big, which means that essentially the cross entropy is not going to be able, by minimizing the cross entropy, you are, will not be able to find any solution. In order to see something from your ground state, you have to move quite a bit. So first of all, the ground state of the cross entropy does not necessarily, is not necessarily uh, a zero error configuration. It's somewhere, it doesn't matter. You have this reference, you know, you have this reference. Uh, by the way, as I said, this curve is obtained by taking beta going to infinity. So we're looking at the ground state. So you first find the ground state of the cross entropy. Now, if alpha is too big, so it doesn't work, from this ground state, you now move around. And in order to see something, so to, to observe a non-trivial entropy here, you have to go far away to start to see something. So you are far away from solutions of the pure classifier. However, <clears throat> at the same time, if alpha is not too big, so in the regime in which we expect the network to work, if you find this curve here, which is telling you two interesting things. First thing is, uh, well, if I find the ground state, I'm immediately surrounded by an exponential number of solutions of the pure classifier. This, by the way, means that also the ground state is a solution of the pure classifier. Okay? So it means that the region is dense. But it also tells us another thing which I think is interesting, which is the following. If you remember the plots, I will show it to you again later, but if you remember the plots that we, I described to you yesterday, in the case of the local entropy solutions, really in which, in which you really look for solutions that have maximum density, here we have chosen at random some loss function, so the cross entropy. In that case, we are really, so we are not sampling from this distribu distribution. We are really looking for the W that maximizes this. If you remember, the curves look like this. So there is a, a range of distances in which there is an overlap with the, with, the, with the binomial, with the maximum possible number of, of solutions. And so what this is telling you is that the cross entropy ground state is not something like this, but it's something like this. So it's suboptimal. It goes in the, um, in the dense regions but probably not in the densest part of the dense regions. So I have no idea of how the geometry of this region looks like. I mean, what is, they are clearly heterogeneous, and this is an example. If you find the ground state using the cross entropy, you will see around you an exponential number of solutions. But we know that for the very same problem, there, is, there exist configurations that are actually um, more dense. So, <clears throat> I will, so let me go back to the, uh, to the action that I've shown you before. Sorry. Sorry. OK. So uh, OK, so this would be somehow the uh, stochastic gradient with, uh, this is a continuous version uh, of the model, but it's related to this. So you see, if you use stochastic gradient with cross entropy, you get, you are, you are in a region which is pretty flat because, you know, the range in which you find eigenvalues different from zero is zero and 200. It's not zero and 2000 like in the case of, of gradient that gets stuck somewhere. But still, it's certainly not the delta function you would observe by really maximizing the, the local entropy. So somehow you are on the boundary of, uh, uh, of the region, or something like that. So it seems to me that this result is uh, a first step in, in our plan. So as I said, uh, deep network are this evolutionary process in which loss functions have been changed. And essentially, people have gone from uh, mean square error to cross entropy. Okay. Then uh, we have the transfer function. Uh, 
uh, uh, well, <coughs> then we have different type of uh, algorithms. I mean, uh, uh, some regularizations and so on. Then we have architectures. And uh, well, then we have data processing, like data augmentation and so on, and many other things, OK? But as far as the machine is concerned, our plan is actually to analyze these four features and, uh, and compare the pure classifier with the modern networks, OK? And for this case here, for the first step in this plan, what we observe is that indeed uh, the reason why uh, people are using cross entropy it's not because of any stochasticity it's just because it's a robust cost function that is attracted by this rare flat minima okay that's that's the evidence we have for of course you know this is the evidence we have for random patterns it's not necessarily i mean it's not a worst case analysis it might be different from from other realistic uh, data set, I don't know. But all the experiments that we have seen are consistent with this. OK? So there's nothing mysterious about this. It's just, and, and as I said, this is not optimal. You could still do better than that. If you think about it, there's a, kind, there's a parameter in the cross entropy, the gamma, the effective temperature you're using. Nobody optimizes over that. That's already a signal that we can compute a, an optimal temperature. So that's a signal that, uh, I mean, it's, it's not optimal in some sense, OK? Now, to be, um, um, <clears throat> to be uh, now chronologically consistent with what we did, this was the first calculation we did. And then we had to go back and uh, go to the next step, which is the case of continuous networks. OK, so this is again for the binary perceptor. Now, the next step would be to, to do, perform the same type of analysis and to show that if you use uh, the cross entropy for a continuous system and you train, you end up in regions that are at the boundary of a wide flat minimum or inside a wide flat minimum. OK, OK, this is shown experimentally here. OK, this is for a, a one in the layer network and this is the the spectrum of the Asian for cross entropy, and this is for the most dense region. So you are not in exactly in the center of. Now, what is the problem? Um, the problem is that if you want to generalize this calculation to the case of um, continuous system, the, the integral that I've wrote before, it becomes impossible. So this is a real problem. We cannot do the same calculations for uh, uh, continuous weights, just because we have to solve equations that contain something like nine, nine nested integrals. Somehow people managed to do this in the 90s, but now we are not able, just because we ask for precision. And uh, I mean, there's a mystery here. I don't know the, the published results that I'm not able to reproduce. Because uh, clearly what they did was to be happy with the very rough approximation of integrals, which is not acceptable nowadays. And so it's a mystery, OK? Some of the results remain a mystery. But um, because when you have to solve equations that depend on six nested integrals, it's really difficult to, to solve the nonlinear equation. But in this case, it's even worse. So how can we show that the same thing happens in continuous networks? OK, now I can go back and uh, Sorry, I, uh, I have to go back here. Yeah. Um, so they, the trick we use is, is this one again. OK? <clears throat> so what we can do now is the following. <clears throat> As I've shown you yesterday, um, um, <clears throat> um, what we can do is actually uh, try to find the solution either by this technique, hmm, which would give us, 
So if, you, if I use the robust ensemble, this is going to give me a solution that, and, and with this I use, uh, sorry, I use the belief propagation algorithm, algorithm on this Hamiltonian here, then I'm going to, to be able to find solutions that are in the center, say, of the wide flat minimum. Okay, this is by construction. We know that this function here is just another way of writing the local entropy, and now by finding the ground states, I'm going to maximize this if I take y big enough. And I know how to do it from an algorithmic point of view. So this thing here is going to give me, you know, the reference, the best thing, possible thing I can do. The second thing I can do is to use different kind of loss functions, so mean square error, cross entropy, for instance, and by using stochastic gradient descent or just gradient descent, I can find uh, uh, solutions, okay? Some configuration of the ways that satisfy the training set. So once I have this, uh, and this is, unfortunately, it's numerical, but once I have this, what I can do is uh, for a given architecture, so you, you take a network of size n, say, equal 10,000, so a pretty big one, and you find so storing random patterns, sorry, and you find solution with, the, say, three algorithms, okay? Then what you can do is just compute uh, the log of the number of solutions that you find at a given overlap or given distance q from the, uh, the solution that you have uh, obtained. And this can be, so in order to compute uh, this quantity here, you can compute this quantity by analytically. Uh, so you want to compute this quantity here, and you don't want to do it numerically because it's an, it's an exponential quantity. And, but you can do it, again, you can use uh, the cavity method or belief propagation to compute this value here. Okay? So for one given sample, for one sample, you can compute the log of the number of configurations uh, around a certain solution within a, a certain distance d. You can, you can do this analytically for one sample. So it's a pseudo-analytic method. For the given problem, training set, and a given architecture, you find a solution, and then keeping that architecture and keeping the same number of patterns, you analytically estimate this number here. Okay? Uh, I mean, this is very well known in error correcting codes. When you design error correcting codes, typically you use random uh, parity check codes. So you, these are random codes that satisfy random linear equation. And then you ask yourself, given a, a code word, which is a ground state, how many other code words do I see at a given distance? This is very important in error correcting codes because if you see other code words which are nearby, you're, you're, not, you're, not, going, uh, you're not going to be able to correct errors. So you want to actually observe the opposite phenomenon in case of error correcting codes. So in the case of error correcting codes, from a ground state, you want to find that there is a distance where nothing happens, and then you start to see solutions. In this case, we are interested to the in the complementary phenomenon in which we want, to given it, we want immediately to find solutions. Okay? And in fact, the two models are somehow complementary. Uh, you cannot use a neural network as an error correcting code, and you cannot use an error correcting code for uh, storing patterns. I, we have just shown that the parity machine doesn't work, and the parity machine is very closely related to an error correcting code. So, and this is what you do. Uh, you can set up an algorithm. So, <clears throat> this algorithm is not very simple because uh, the, the, the idea is the following. So, you take a, let me draw it like this. Uh, 
okay, you have a network with more or less this architecture, and for a given configuration of the weights, you want to compute how many other configurations of the weights at a given overlap exist that satisfy all the training set analytically. The problem is that these weights are real numbers now. So uh, in order to, um, to write the belief propagation equations, you have to deal with integrals over the probability distributions of these weights, and this is difficult to, uh, to <coughs> analyze, okay? to, to write in an efficient manner. However, luckily enough, uh, you can, all the sum that appear here turn out to be uh, Gaussian sums. So you can apply the central limit theorem. And so you can essentially close these functional equations. I'm not entering the details. You, can, you will find it if you're interested. But you can close the equation only in terms of expectation values and variances of, of, of these fields here. Okay, so one can write this equation and close them in an efficient manner. So you can actually find a way of writing these equations for these complicated networks, continuous network. And so you are able to compute these logarithms uh, very efficiently on one hand. On the other hand, you can also, this is on one side, and so we can compute these quantities here. And if we do this, what we obtain, sorry, are, uh, I, I don't know where I put it, sorry, I have missed, uh, um, okay, so let me, okay, so then you obtain curves like this, okay, for different algorithms, and, and you can observe that indeed, uh, I don't have the curve here, but in the case of cross entropy, you indeed observe that there's a little flatness. So this is the best you can do, and with cross entropy, you're doing something like that. And if you do mean square error, you're doing something like that. Okay? So the region you find with the different loss function, uh, um, the solution you find are uh, f more or less flat depending on the loss function you use. And the cross entropy, is flatter than the mean square error, and it's still not optimal. Okay, I apologize that I, I thought I had the, the picture, but I didn't. I didn't put it, so I, I apologize. But anyhow, this is the scenario you find. So this is with uh, uh, this is the optimal, and this is cross entropy, and this is mean square error, right? and then you have other algorithm, greedy algorithms that are uh, even less dense. So this uh, analytic calculation, which is you know, kind of 30 pages long, uh, allows you to compute this curve and so show that also for continuous systems, you can actually uh, find these solutions, okay? So that uh, the cross entropy ends up in the dense regions. Because here you can also compute which is the typical density of a, sorry, which is the density of a typical solution, okay? Because we can build some planted models, in which like, so we can build the model in which we know which is a typical solution, and we can compute which is the weight enumerator function using the language of error correcting code. So the number of solutions you, you would observe at a given distance for the most probable solutions, the, the most numerous ones, and, and you find that the curve is something like that, okay? And then with maximizing the entropy, you find something like that, so clearly, these regions exist, and you can show that the cross entropy does something like that. So it's not optimal, but it's pretty good. I mean, there's still space for improvement. This is the first thing. The second thing is that if we take the replicated graph, so I, I mentioned this yesterday, but now I think it's much uh, more clear. If, yeah, if we take the replicated graph that you know the, the 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 replicated Hamiltonian in which we couple the different replicates, so that we are we know that the typical solution of this system will be the dense ones. We can actually and we write the BP equations for this system using all these tricks. We can actually write an algorithm that works for finding solutions very efficiently for uh, at the moment for shallow networks. We didn't try for deeper networks. That 
are of this type. So we have an algorithm for finding these solutions that uh, not only analytically, but concretely for, uh, for these networks, and, and, and these are the results. OK? OK, good. So um, yeah, um, I think I want to, I, 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 I scrambled a bit because I was worried. for. So I think I'm going to wrap up now. And if there are questions, we can discuss. Now, um, the next step is, I hope it is clear, no, the scenario now. We have shown that the state exists in, in discrete and continuous networks. They are attractive for different type of no, uh, algorithms. Cross entropy ends up there. We have some analytical connection right now that uh, show that the same thing is true for uh, the transfer function. So why, peop why do people use ReLU functions? Okay? Because the dynamics with ReLU functions tend to end up in this region. They help. So this is something I, I, don't want, I didn't want to tell you about because we still even have to write it in LaTeX, but, uh, <clears throat> but it's, you know, it's the second step in the process. And uh, you know, another step in the process would be to ask, uh, it's pretty clear that th tricks like uh, dropout are, again, as you noticed before, I mean, uh, they're in this uh, setup. And now the key question will be, what about the architecture? Is it that we are using many layers because it's easier to end up in this kind of states when you have more layers rather than a, a, a wide, wide and few layers, OK, architecture? That's the other step that we need to investigate, and we didn't start even yet, but why not? One thing that I can tell you is that what we, uh, everybody knows is that training wide networks is harder, is difficult when you have a lot of hidden units and a shallow network. Finding the ground states is it's difficult, practically, I mean. And uh, so even from this replicated, even though, for, for instance, uh, these wide flat minima, even though they exist, it might be that it's still a bit complicated to find them because we are not convexifying the problem. So, and so maybe you need uh, more layers to, uh, to avoid this need of having an enormous number of uh, hidden units in the first layer, which would make the problem more difficult to, to optimize. Okay, so this is the, uh, maybe the hint, maybe I'm wrong, we will see. I mean, this is not... What I can say today is just that loss, the cross entropy loss goes there, and the uh, ReLU also. Then, you know, architecture will come and other tricks will come, maybe. So, but I think that this is going, already shows something about, so there's all this discussion going on about the nature of the ground states in deep networks. For instance, uh, the, at the beginning, I was mentioning you typical questions, so typical observation that you find in the literature. One observation is that all the minima are connected. We know that this is not the case. I mean, just in a one hidden layer continuous network, we know that there's ergodicity breaking. We know that this is not the case. However, if you use a, the cross entropy as a loss function, you will always end up in a connected region. And so only, the only thing you would observe is, yeah, connected solutions. So again, if you just look at your system with the, with the eyes of the optimized system, which you have already you know, hidden all the complexity by the choices that you have made, you only see a part of the solution space, and so you get this impression. I mean, this is a strange thing about literature. You know, there are results that are 20 or 30 years old, which are completely ignored, and people can claim things that are you know, uh, obviously wrong, because uh, you can show analytically that they are wrong, right? So this is one, uh, one point. And the other point is, uh, people observe that the dynamics is not glassy, so that somehow learning is easy. But again, it is easy because we have already chosen uh, a loss function and uh, um, <coughs> uh, maybe transfer function that confine yourself in a subspace in which uh, uh, things are easier. For instance, if we take the local entropy as a cost function, we run simulated annealing, in, we will have the impression that the system we are observing is a ferromagnet. Boom, you easily find the ground state. But as soon as we go back and you know, get, use the, the classification 
uh, machine, you know, the pure classifier has a reference model, we know that this model is very complex and highly uh, glassy. So it's very, very risky to, you know, take your finite model and do some simulation because you risk not to understand anything because you have already, the reason they work is that you have already <laughs> washed away all the complexity, okay? So you have, one has to go back and build step by step. I mean, this is our, our approach, okay? So, sorry, I, I missed completely the, um, the timing uh, because I've more or less finished what I wanted to say in this lecture. It's half an hour early, but in any case, I have to take a taxi. And so we have still 15 minutes or so to, for discussion if you want, okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is a very interesting, so it's, I just, tell to the others. So he's asking, well, given that you have this scenario, can you give us an algorithm that behaves better? Okay. First of all, let's define the context. So let's consider shallow networks, just for simplicity, and you use a teacher, or you can set up a teacher-student scenario in which you generate data with a certain data generator, and you learn and you check your capability of inferring the rule. In this context, the answer is yes. We can show that uh, uh, the wider is the minimum, the better is the generalization. They correlate. Now, the next question, but we are not using any trick here. We are just you know, taking mean square error, cross entropy, and uh, the, the, the robust ensemble which goes in the high entropy regions and compare the performance of the three on a data set, and that's it, okay? But when you go to deep networks, things are more complicated than this because you take a huge data set, and then you have your network with this, uh, that has a very complicated architecture in which you have cross-entropy, dropout, um, batch renormalization, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, I mean, you probably have something that goes into this wide flat minima. So certainly we don't get worse performance, and we get comparable performance. The, the question would be, you know, if you just use local entropy, uh, and compare it with just stochastic gradient with a cost function certainly does better. But then when you start adding all these tricks, things are so complicated that I don't, I don't even know how to compare. It's a bit, uh, but I don't, so the question in my view as a physicist, the question is more, can you find a simple learning process that is performant? That's more or less, because hopefully we might end up in something which is of a relevance also for neuroscience or something like that. So. Um, the inter I, mean, I think that the interesting question is, once you have understood some basic fundamental mechanism, can you find algorithms that are uh, more realistic? And of course, if you can improve performance, but they're so sophisticated, the, 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 the network, the algorithms, and so on, that beside the MNIST, which is, you know, just forget about that, which, because uh, I mean, it's too easy. So there's no way of doing anything more than, I mean, it's not, but on, on toy models, yes, we do observe. When everything is under control, we do observe this clear correlation. And I think this can be made be sound theoretically also, but we have not yet worked much on that, even though it's, I think there's quite some agreement on the fact that white flat minima are needed to generalize well. And the reason is robustness, the fact that uh, uh, <laughs> Is not overfitting because if you have this wide flat mean, it's, it's, this is not just a random minimum. It is the largest one, so it means that you are maximizing an entropy. So you are constraining the system to have maximum entropy, and this is what gives you uh, <coughs> robustness with respect to overfitting and this kind of of things. So, uh, it's just robustness is very well known to work in this sense, and this is a, an intrinsic way of, of doing it. Uh, <coughs> So, what, what was your view of the landscape of deep networks? What is your view of the, <laughs> of the landscape of deep networks? Do you have uh, any uh, alternative opinion? Well, I don't know if you have ever worked on that, so I mean, uh, uh, you don't need to uh, have uh, an opinion. But, uh, <clears throat> because other results, in the literature that you find is are that all these minima are more or less equivalent. And you know, this is not true. It's just not true. I mean, at least in this shallow network, then you know, of course, once you have cured the mo your model and you have changed everything, maybe everything becomes equivalent because 
what is left are only these dense regions. So, of course, at that point, everything. But not in principle. That's not the, the case. Yeah. But so in, in this case, I mean, not all minima are equivalent, but the white plus minima, so the white plus regions, I mean, we have many of those. And how do we? And, <laughs> and how, how are they related? Like they are equivalent? They're not so, you don't have so many wide flat minima. The, so so the, you have two entropies here. One is um, <coughs> the total entropy, so the total number of solutions, say. And then you can count how many dense regions you have. Okay? And so the number of dense regions is uh, uh, exponentially smaller than the number, total number of solutions. So you have relatively few dense regions. And uh, so those are probably, yes, they are probably equivalent. Yes, there are also some symmetries in this network. So, but you don't have a, that huge number, okay? So that's the, because they are, of course, since they are flat and wide, the point is that they are wide on a scale which is of the order of the size of the system. So then you cannot have many of them, right? Uh, so that's the, the main uh, point, yeah. Okay, so thank you, and I apologize for the mess now. <laughs>